is Jean Hoffman, and as Peter said, I'm the Program Officer-in-Law at the Institute for Humane Studies. What that means is I'm the person in charge of helping people who are considering going to law school and people who are currently in law school succeed at careers and ideas. A part of IHS's mission is to help students succeed at career and ideas, which can include academia, policy, nonprofits, and journalism. But it includes a lot more. And before I launch into my little thing about law school and beyond, uh, I just wanted to give a plug for the um, Students for Liberty's regional conferences. I went to their inaugural one in New York, and it was my birthday, and I have to say that was possibly the best time I've ever spent my birthday doing. So I highly recommend going to their regional conferences if they have one near you. Now, Law School and Beyond is also the name of IHS's uh, book on law school. So if you're interested in this book, feel free to contact me. My contact information is down at the bottom right to get the whole thing. The amount of time I have to speak to you is not nearly enough to go through everything that is <laughs> involved in going to law school and deciding what to do about law school and if you should go to law school. So I'm a resource to you. So um, feel free to write down my email address. I'll put it down. I'll put it up again at the end, but basically everyone's case is unique, so the advice I'm going to give is broad, but if you think you're the exception, if you think you don't fit into specific areas of what I'm talking about, feel free to contact me and talk to me about your personal situation and what you're interested in doing, and I can help you figure out how to have the career that you want to have. All right, so I was asked to talk to you about who should go to law school. Um, I've decided to reject this question and change it. So instead of who should go to law school, it's going to be who should not go to law school. So my first candidate here is someone who's just graduating, undergraduate. He has no idea what he wants to do for a career. He thinks law school sounds like a good thing to do because it's more school and, well, lawyers get a job. Well, there's a huge spread in the amount of salary that people make coming out of law school. So it's not necessarily always a good fallback if you don't know if you want to be a lawyer or not. There's plenty of good jobs that you can get straight out of undergraduate. And I know that when I was an undergraduate, it took IHS to tell me what types of jobs were available to me upon graduation. So if it's a fear thing, don't simply jump into law school. There's a lot of debt. And the thing with law school is being a lawyer is a niche career. It's professional school. It's teaching you to do very specific things, and you shouldn't jump into something so specific if you don't know what you want to do. The other person who should not go to law school is someone who wants to make lots and lots of money doing something. There's a lot of different careers that are profitable. And if you don't feel passion for the law, note that a high salary at a good law firm also comes with hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. So if, you're, if you don't feel passionate about reading case law and underlining things and highlighting things for the rest of your life, that might not be the best trade-off for you for um, what you want to do. You can also get an MBA. You can go into business. There's a lot of profitable careers out there. And there's a huge gap between um, the average salary and the highest salary you can get as a lawyer, too. So take that into consideration when deciding whether or not you want to go to law school. So then who should go to law school? Someone who wants to be a lawyer. And I can't emphasize that enough. Someone who wants to be a lawyer. If you feel passionate about doing something that you could see a lawyer doing, and possibly one of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, then you should consider being a lawyer. If you don't really feel any passion towards the law or case studies or anything associated with being a lawyer, talk to me about other careers that you can also do to advance liberty. So why would I want to be a lawyer? Um, I'm a little spoiled in that I work at a nonprofit, so it's very hard for me to figure out why someone would want to be a private lawyer. But if you want to get in the courtroom, if you want to um, argue before a judge, know that that's probably going to be 10% of your time if you're, if you're a private practicing lawyer, but you would still get to do that. So if you feel passion in that sort of avenue, then go into private law and feel free. But I, I have more to say to you more about um, advancing liberty as a lawyer. So how can you advance liberty as a lawyer? Well, there's a few ways. You can go into academia. So basically, academia is becoming a professor uh, who teaches law. The interesting thing about law compared to the other areas in which you can be a professor is that law academia changes 
current law. People are writing on current issues. They're not analyzing what Plato said something about a long time ago or the effects something that happened a few decades ago had on society today. It's analyzing how laws should change. And judges often cite academics in their decisions. So you have an actual tangible effect on society. Uh, so it's a very quick way to uh, advance liberty. Uh, a few blogs recently that um, IHS alums have written for have been cited. Blogs, not law review articles, but actual blogs have been cited by judges in pretty important decisions. So that's one thing that you can do. You could be a professor. Another thing you could do is go into public interest law. And the first thing that people think of um, when you say public interest law in the liberty movement is the Institute for Justice. But there are a lot of other public interest law firms that advance liberty. There's the Washington uh, Legal Foundation. There's the Pacific Legal Foundation. There's a lot of things that you can go into. So if this is an area that excites you, don't worry about specifically IJ. Everyone wants to work for IJ because that's the one that they know by name. There's a lot of options out there where your job is to find cases and protect liberty for people who are being trampled on by the government in some cases. Uh, IJ is the one that argued the Kelo case, for example, where someone's house was taken for a housing development. Um, so it, it's a very exciting field to be in where you can be the one person who's standing up for liberty. Another area is policy. Uh, I put up a picture of the Mercatus Center there. That's the Institute for Humane Studies sister organization. And um, the nice thing about a law degree, to be completely honest, is it kind of gives you a shortcut into all the benefits that people with PhDs get in policy. So um, a philosophy PhD might take you eight years. An economics PhD might take you five to seven. But a JD takes you three years. And for example, one person at the Mercatus Center, uh, Jerry Brito, um, he writes a lot of policy. He also is an adjunct professor at George Mason University. And he got there through the shortcut of a JD. Uh, so if current policy excites you, if you want to be constantly writing about ideas, uh, current ideas, then, then po policy would be a place for you. Basically, um, academia talks more about the ideas behind the laws, and policy is a little bit more forward in that you're writing, this should be the law, this should be changed, people should be doing this. Uh, so it's, an, it's another exciting field to be in. Now, my field is nonprofit. JD can also help you get a good job in a nonprofit. So um, if you're looking to do something with your law degree where you want to use the analysis to apply to something else. So, um, I work at the Institute for Humane Studies. I work on a website called cosmosonline.org that's dedicated towards helping academics succeed. And I also work on a bunch of different programs that require the knowledge that someone who has an advanced degree uh, would have. So nonprofits are, you wouldn't necessarily be practicing law in the courtroom, but you would be utilizing your law degree and you would have a jump ahead um, in front of everyone else. So this is a picture of IHS and a that's me over there. Um, and that's, to my left, the president of IHS. Uh, I s snuck over to stand next to her in the picture. <laughs> but anyway, so where should you go if you're interested in um, becoming a lawyer? Number one thing, generically, that you should look at is top ranked. Law school isn't like undergraduate school, where you can find uh, a nice liberal arts school that you enjoy the trees and the foliage and the neighborhood that will get you where you want to go in life and then also you would have a good time there. Law school is very competitive so if you want to be an academic you really want to aim for the top three schools if not Yale University itself. Uh, ranking means a lot. Uh, law is very competitive so if you want to practice privately, if you want to be an academic certainly shoot for the highest ranked school that you can. Unfortunately, this may, be, this may mean um, living out the cold in Boston or Michigan, but it's worth it for the three years uh, for what you would get on return. But you don't necessarily have to go to the top ranked if, for other reasons. You might have a specialty that you want to take advantage of. So if you're interested in human rights or immigration law, um, asylum law, things like that. There are schools that have 
uh, clinics there that specialize in it. So you'd want to look for something that specializes in it. So if you're interested in human rights, you might be more interested in going to NYU, even though you got into a, a higher ranked school, because it has the specialty you want to work in. Uh, so that's a way of directly applying uh, what you want to do in the future to what decision you're going to make with law school, which is what you need to be doing. You need to look down the road at where you want to be and make your decisions based on that. There's also um, regional and networking opportunities. So for example, if you want to work in DC, you can either go to law school somewhere else and spend all your summers interning in DC, or you might want to go to a law school in the DC area so that you would have the opportunity to network with people so that once you graduate from law school, you're right in the center of everyone. Everyone knows who you are, and it's easier for you to get a job. There's also the issue of scholarships. So if you want to do something um, completely um, something completely out of the realm of private practice or academia, uh, like let's say working in a nonprofit, having a higher ranked law school will definitely help you in that. But if you know you're going to go into a, the type of job that's never going to pay you the amount that you spend in law school, you might want to look into scholarships. That's what I did when I went to law school because I knew I wanted to work in a nonprofit. So I looked for something, a school that was good, but then that could, I could also afford uh, based on what my salary was going to be after graduating. So these are multiple things to take into consideration, and some of them conflict with each other, which is why it's really important to think about what your priorities are when going into law school and what you want to do after. So then once I choose a law school, how do I succeed? The number one thing to remember is always work towards what you are aiming for. I could spend probably an hour talking about uh, being on law review, which you should try to be on, or doing moot court, which you should do, or getting great internships during the summer, which you should also do. Um, but that information is available in our uh, law school and beyond, which you can find on cosmosonline.org, K-O-S-M-O-S-Online.org, that goes into specific details about all of those items. But that advice isn't always true for everyone. You need to look at what you want to do. So for example, if you're interested in doing policy, if you can spend um, some of your time doing moot court or some of your time writing articles that are going to get published somewhere, you might want to focus more on writing articles or submitting things to magazines or going to network events where you get to meet people that you're going to work with uh, in the future, or you at least hope to work with. So the standard advice is, like I said, get amazing grades, which you should be working for no matter what your end goal is. You should be focusing on your grades. But then um, do law review, do moot court, but if those are holding you back from doing something else that you really believe will significantly help your career, then take that route. And if you have questions about the specific routes that you, um, you would, might want to take, feel free again to contact me. So um, what does IHS do for law students? We have one thing that's really great if you're interested in nonprofits or policies. We have our um, Charles G. Koch Summer Fellowship Program, which is basically a program where you intern in DC, you're paid a stipend and provided housing, which is hard to come by in DC. I can tell you that um, I interned in DC three times while I was a student, and it was the only time I wasn't practically showing up to every event that I could think of that had free food just to survive, uh, so I didn't start to that. Uh, it, they provide the housing, and housing is so uh, expensive in DC, and I really felt like the Coke Summer Fellow Program is really what helped me get my breakthrough in DC, because I could actually focus on what I was doing. It also offers um, classes at night where you can go and watch different policy analysts speak on what they're researching on, which can help you focus on what you would like to do. We also have Humane Studies Fellowships, which are fellowships for graduate school, where we'll give scholarships to people who are going to law school for the purpose of going into academia or public interest, public policy, or nonprofit law. And this is useful in that it can free up a lot of your time if you need to work um, extra time in order to pay for law school or to prevent having loans that you have to pay back that you probably won't be able to afford if you're working at a nonprofit, uh, the Humane Studies Fellowship can really make a difference 
in affording law school. We also have our Law Scholars Conference, which is specifically for people interested in academia, um, where you can listen to other people who were once in your shoes, who are now practicing professors, and listen to what helped them succeed in becoming professors. I am also a resource for you, and again, that's my contact information, because I, I feel it's really hard to get into every single thing that you're going to need in law school in this talk because things are different if you're interested in academia or if you're interested in law firms or if you're interested in policy or, or nonprofit. So please, please feel free to contact me and, and give me all of your questions uh, so that I can help you figure out the right route for yourself. There's also the resource of cosmosonline.org. It's our new website that launched two weeks ago. And if you look, um, let's see, right up in the bottom left, it says join a group and get started. Uh, we have different groups for people who are interested in different areas like economics, political science, philosophy, um, but especially for you guys, there's a law group. There's also a group on applying to graduate level school. That's very useful. Both of those groups are active in discussing going to law school, should I get a PhD or a JD, how should I do my applications, and you can post your question there and you would not only have me, but the other 900 people who are on the website uh, to answer your questions. So basically that's as far as I'm going to go into now because I, I don't know what you guys are interested in. Uh, this is the first time I've ever given a lecture without being able to make eye contact with the people in the audience. Um, so feel free to ask me to give more information in the Q&A period so I can direct this all towards what you all are interested in. Uh, so that's it for what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be turning this over to um, Sam Ekman who's going to continue. Did you get that all right, Sam? All right, yep, I'm here. Thank you, Gene. That was a great presentation. I would like to reiterate just what Gene said for everybody about um, the Law School and Beyond book that uh, the IHS puts out. It's a great resource. It helped me through the process of application, which I'll be talking about now, and uh, really goes really year by year up to the point of getting a, getting a job and a career in law. So I certainly recommend checking that out. They've got it available online in PDF format and also in print, so um, should be pretty accessible to you. Uh, as was mentioned by Peter at the outset of this um, webinar, my name is Samuel Ekman. I'm a co-founder and director of Students for Liberty. And I'm uh, currently a law student, just started up now at uh, the University of Chicago Law School. Had my first day today, so it's pretty exciting. It's a great experience. But I'll be talking mostly about the, what I've been going through over the past year in the process of, uh, of applying for law school. Some of you may already be on down this path if you plan on applying for uh, to begin in the fall of 2011. Uh, this might be a little um, uh, things you're familiar with. If not, great. Um, I'll introduce you to the real resource that you'll be using in the process of applying to law schools. And as you can see on the screen, that's going to be the Law School Admission Council. That's LSAC. Uh, their website is accessible at www.lsac.org, and they're responsible for administering essentially all law school uh, applications as well as the law school admission test, the LSAT, uh, which you should all be getting ready for. Um, right now you will see uh, my portal on the LSAC website. Um, you have school list, active applications, completed applications, and then you also have the credential assembly service. It's got letters of recommendations, transcripts, reports, and so on. Uh, what LSAC does, and you'll find that they're both your best friend and your worst enemy, so it, uh, it integrates all the information that you have, your transcripts, letters of recommendation, your LSAT score, personal statements, supplementary materials, the actual applications. You're all going to be doing it through the LSAC website. It's a little dense at times because everything's going through them and a little innavigable sometimes but also it saves you having to send out 10 copies of your transcripts to every school that you're going to be applying to. Uh, your recommenders only have to send in one letter of recommendation. And LSAC takes care of submitting all those materials to the individual schools that you want to go to. Um, so that's going to be a good resource for you and one that you have to use anyway, so learn to love it. 
Now, first things first, you'll see that under My Law Schools and Applications, the My School list. So if you click on that, you'll get a list of, or an error, and I'll have to log back in. But if you go to that My School list, you'll get a list of all the schools that you've selected to attend or to apply to, and you can also search in the top right for your additional schools. This will just simply give you an overview of where you have currently that you're working on applying to. Then you can go back to that main page and actually see your active applications. Right now, I have none active, but if you had some that were open, they'd be showing up there and it would also tell you what other things you still need to submit. So if I go to my completed applications, since this was last year, you'll see all the schools that I had applied to. And you can go under either one of these, just um, click on it, and it will show you all the uh, material that you've already submitted there. So the law school report is something that LSAC will itself put together based on your transcripts and letters of recommendation as well as your LSAT. Uh, you'll see the application as to down, um, whether it's been sent yet, the school's instructions you can pull up, uh, the certification letter that you would have to uh, electronically assign, whether your transcript has been added, whether your recommendation letters have been added, and other um, necessary information. So you can easily access uh, information about where your, how completed your application is and what you still need to add on to it. As I said, all the um, materials will be going through LSAC. So you're going to want to be getting your letters of recommendation and your transcripts sent to, uh, to LSAC. There is information available on the site. Uh, you'll have to print out for each one of those things um, a sort of cover letter that LSAC provides to standardize uh, their um, integration materials, I suppose. And um, you'll want to be sending that out to the appropriate people, either your recommenders or the registrar's office at your university, in order to uh, get that information properly forwarded to LSAC. Then you would go into that active applications uh, tab that I showed you earlier and you would simply be able to select Add Materials, and it would show you all the letters of recommendation that are available and uh, other materials that you're able to essentially just drop and you know, drag and drop under each ap application. So to the necessary materials, uh, it's going to be the big ones that I'm sure you're familiar with already, but you're going to have your transcript. Again, that's going to be sent to LSAC by your school, and your school should have information available on their website about how to get those official transcripts, and it's important you have the official one, how to get those uh, requested to, uh, to LSAC. But that gets done through the registrar's office, so if you aren't able to find the information online, just give them a call. Uh, the next point will be the letters of recommendation, which I've mentioned. Uh, law schools have different requirements as to how many letters that they want. Typically, the standard seems to be two letters of recommendation, and there is a heavy preference towards getting those from professors. If you've been out of school for a few years, if you've got, uh, if you've been in the workforce doing work that might be related, uh, it's not a bad thing to get a letter for, from a from a supervisor in the workplace. But it would still always be preferable to have one from a professor. Uh, for my purposes, when I applied, I got two letters of recommendation from professors, and then for uh, schools that admitted more than two, usually they'll allow another optional recommendation letter or two, if you'd like. Uh, I had my supervisor at work uh, provide a letter. That would only be submitted in the case that they made room for uh, additional letters beyond the two uh, professor recommendations. Uh, you've probably heard this before, but always make sure those letters are coming from people who, know, who you know. Um, you don't want to get something that's just from a prominent name, because the admission committee are really concerned about what your work ethic is like, about what your academic inclinations are, and other relevant information to their decisions. So simply having a, a big name professor uh, write you a letter isn't really going to be helpful to them in that decision and won't be helpful to you in getting admitted to the school. Um, you should be uh, sending an address stamped envelope, of course, to your recommender just as a matter of courtesy. They're doing you a favor. Uh, keep it low cost and easy for them. Uh, you'll want to provide a cover letter or a biographical essay or something to that um, to that end, uh, which will give them some background on what you want them to talk about. That will typically be 
academic skills, work ethic, but especially analytical abilities. So if it's, you can talk about maybe, um, you know, GPA, LSAT score, also times where you've shown the skills that will be relevant to your success in law school. Um, it's not necessary, I don't think, to, to try to choose a recommender based on your subject areas of study in school, but I focused on uh, typically philosophy and particularly a logic professor I had a good relationship with because those sorts of logical and deductive reasoning skills that you see a lot on the L side, which we'll get to, are really relevant. And so if you have somebody that can speak to the analytical side of, of what you've uh, done in school, that would probably be beneficial. But again, just to make sure you're including enough information to them so they know what you want them to focus on and what you'd like them to talk about. So a cover letter, a resume, something like that. Again, LSAC does have a required form you have to send out with those uh, recommendation letters. The um, recommender just has, it's pretty much the verification or certification that everything's true. The recommender has to sign it and mail it in with the actual letter. Uh, so we have a transcript of letters of recommendation. Of course, you're going to have to take the LSAT. Uh, they have four administrations of that, usually in late September or early October. They've got one in December, one in March typically, and the other in June. Uh, the, LSAC is go the LSAT is going to be curved. The average tends to be around 151. Uh, lowest score is 120, and the highest is 180. Um, I found myself when I was getting ready to take the LSAT trying to sort of game when I thought the best time would take it to be as far as of the general pool that you're going to be in. So, for example, um, typically people will take it in either June or September for the next year's application cycle. So if I was going to be going to school in a, if I wanted to apply to begin next fall, I would want to take it typically the first time at least, no later than, than September. And then you have uh, a December administration where if you don't get the grades you want, you can, uh, you can take it again and hopefully get an improvement. Um, I would recommend definitely taking it no later than September so that you do have that buffer. If you have a really bad test day, you have one more chance to do well. Most schools, though not all, most schools will average together the, uh, the two grades that you get. All schools will allow you to submit an addendum or some sort of note explaining, you know, I had the flu the day that I took it the first time. And you know, if there is a significant difference in the score that you got, um, they'll take that into consideration. Uh, the LSAT and the GPA are going to be the two biggest factors that are considered in law school admissions. So you should really be making sure uh, that you're giving yourself adequate time to study. Uh, I recommend at least two months to really hunger down and study about two hours a day minimum, I'd say, at least you know, at least four days a week probably. What I would recommend as far as studying goes are the power score uh, Bibles. There's like the Logic Games Bible, Logical Reasoning Bible. And after that, really just plugging away at the um, at practice LSATs. LSAC itself puts out uh, collections of, I think it's called like 10 actual official uh, LSAT prep tests or something like that. You can find them on Amazon. They're actual previous administrations of the exam. It will be the best way for you to get prepared. They're actual tests that have been used. You can kind of get a feel for what the problems look like and get used to working your way through them. It follows specific patterns, all the, all the questions. So uh, it's just a matter of really getting used to and familiarizing yourself with the material that you're going to see on there. Um, as to the classes that are offered, you're typically going to get the same information out of the classes you get out of uh, the, the books. So it comes down to a matter of how you work best and how you study best. If you consider yourself somebody, and be honest with yourself about this, that has a tough time just sitting down for two or three hours straight and doing problems out of a book, then the class might be worthwhile. Again, it's the discipline that you're getting out of the class more than the information or the material. So it's going to just be a simple matter of how you study best. Uh, so once you have the LSAT done, uh, as I mentioned, you're going to want to add all this information together on LSAT into your application package. And based on the individual application requirements of the school, you'll be required to add some sort of personal statement. Some schools will have additional essays uh, that they ask you to fill out, short essays, long essays, uh, additional biographical material, perhaps. And usually, they'll require a resume. 
uh, when it comes to the personal statements, uh, there's tons of books out there on how to create, how to write a good personal statement, which group things you should be talking about, and how to pretty much woo the school. Um, those are worthwhile to take a look at, maybe go to the library. I wouldn't put too much stock in them simply because the personal statement is, of course, as the name indicates, a very personal thing. So you're going to be trying to communicate your fit with the school and uh, both what you can contribute to the school and why you think that school is the right place for you to be. The most important thing, I think, in doing that is to actually know the school that you're applying to. You're not going to want to make a cookie cutter uh, personal statement like you may have for undergrad and just mail it out to all the schools that you're in. You want to write a significantly or substantially different uh, uh, personal statement for each school. Go onto the school's websites, research what they take pride in. What kind of a, if they have a mission statement online, and if they do, what does it say? What sort of clinics do they have at the school? What sort of um, colloquia and symposia do they have available throughout the year? Do they have any special sort of a niche focuses of study? And talk about that so that you know something about the school. And most importantly, try to work that into what you're talking about. So for example, uh, Berkeley, the Bold School, is uh, well known for its empirical legal studies program. They focus a lot on trying to measure the predictability of, of court decisions in a statistically rigorous way. So you can talk about that program that they have there and how they're well regarded in that sense, how you're interested in that specific area of study. You have some background, maybe a course you took in undergrad about, about that, and try to connect it to your broader uh, experience. And most importantly, you're going to be trying to establish a narrative that just provides the admission committee some insight into who you are as a person, who you are as a student, why you want to go to law school, and why it's a logical step. Going back to what Gene um, had said, it is important to know that what you want to get out of law school, that it is a professional school, and they are looking to create people who will succeed within the area of law. So simply saying that this is something I find interesting, it's cool, I care about justice, all great, but not necessarily uh, something that's going to win over an admission committee. You have to make a strong connection between yourself, your motivations for going to law school, that it's something that you're going to stick with, and why that school specifically appeals to you. And again, as I mentioned briefly before, there are sometimes supplemental materials that they will request. So for example, you have the option to write a diversity essay for most schools. Uh, some schools, like I think Michigan, requires you to write at least four out of six or seven short essays in response to some um, to some prompts that they give you. Um, to those, the real crucial fact, I think, is just to make sure that you're presenting yourself professionally, that you're utilizing the analytical skills that they want you to show as a student, and that you're, um, that you're being consistent and professional in your writing. Um, Beyond that, I will stop, I think, and uh, turn it over to questions. But again, just remember that in your entire package of the application, you're trying to present yourself as, in, as a bright, intelligent, responsible, uh, holistically qualified person that will fit in not only at the law school, but in the legal profession generally. And so as you go through the process of applications, you should be doing every step towards how how you can make that case to the Law School Admissions Committee. But that will uh, turn you over to questions. All right, thanks a lot, Sam and Gene. Um, the first question is from Nathan. And it's, what are the ideal law schools to apply to as a student interested in advancing liberty? Are there any schools with liberty-centric curriculum? I mean, George Mason is one of them. Um, the whole university isn't um, necessarily specifically a liberty advancing center, but um, the law school and the economics department definitely are. Um, another place um, that's at least liberty friendly, and there's a lot of professors there who aren't necessarily liberty advancers, but who like to help liberty advancers, is um, University of Chicago. So those are the two that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, um, to add to that, law school as a profession, or law school as an academic 
area, I suppose. Like most tend to be pretty liberal leaning. Um, I, I do think there's plenty of opportunities, of course, at uh, at Chicago. They've got a much stronger conservative or libertarian um, student body, as far as you know, groups such as the Federalist Society go. Uh, there's a very strong representation among the students in that uh, with, with that inclination. Uh, George Mason is probably stronger towards the actual um, um, uh, academic or the uh, professorial uh, side of it, though. All right, the next question, it's actually two questions come from Edgar, and he's got a microphone, so I'm going to unmute him and let him take it. Go ahead, Edgar. Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question, uh, too. One, there seems to be a conspiracy, at least with regards to LSAT scores. Some schools weigh them very highly, and some weigh them very lowly. Um, how do you find out who weighs it much at a higher level? And my second question was, uh, let's say you want to get to a specific school, but you don't think that you'll get there immediately out of undergraduate. Will getting a master's degree and getting really high marks in the master's degree and then applying to the school that you wanted improve your chances any? Thank you. Mm, thank you. Um, I would say uh, you can find all the information online as to uh, incoming class profiles. Uh, usually on each school's website, they'll let you know the average GPA and LSAT scores of the of the most recent class. You can also go to a um, website, toplawschools.com, I believe it is. It's got dashes in between, so I think it's top-law-schools.com or .org, something like that. That's got um, rankings as well as to uh, the rankings of the law school as well as the, you know, uh, the average GPA and uh, LSAT. So some schools, as you mentioned, do weigh the LSAT very heavily. Um, I think other ones will weigh the, um, the GPA very heavily. I know Stanford, for instance, uh, is much more focused on GPA than LSAT. I think Columbia is more focused on LSAT than GPA, but don't hold me to that. You know, look this stuff up, and just based on the averages, you do tend to get a feel there's different philosophies as to why they would weight one more than the other. Uh, GPA, of course, uh, you, you're dealing with a longer um, sample time. It's how can people do over the whole of four years of studying more than just how do you perform on one three-hour exam. Uh, on the other hand, the LSAT is, of course, sort of a level, leveling field where everyone's in the same condition. They're taking the same exam. You can, whether you're a chemistry major or an art history major, you're on the same plane when you take it. So uh, there's that to be said for weighing the LSAT more heavily. And that's why I think a lot of schools do weigh the LSAT so heavily. Uh, if you don't have the scores that you want to, it doesn't make sense to go to a graduate school. I mean, it could potentially be helpful. I mean, if you go to a graduate school and do great and kind of, um, um, you know, if you started off in your undergrad and just didn't do as well as you think your potential uh, is, it, it could. but it's expensive, and you're taking a lot of time out of your out of your life. So I really wouldn't advise that if it goes if it comes down to um, just trying to get you into a better law school. I think you would have to have some other pretty compelling reasons and uh, some real relationship between that advanced degree and where you want to go in your life. Can I ask the question? Mm -hmm. Ask her a question. Sure. Uh, what what do you want to do with a law degree? Well, uh, I'd like to go to Chicago, and I'd like to work with um, with uh, the Institute for Justice, and also go into academia. I'd love to be able to work with people like Randy Barnett, or argue with Judge Posner, or get to that level. Sometimes, what's more effective than going out and getting a master's degree is working for a while and proving yourself at some sort of industry that's similar to law but not quite there. So then you can take that experience and use it and then your GPA or your LSAT doesn't necessarily count as much. It still counts, but the further you get away in your career from your, your grades, the less they matter overall. Um, but feel free to email me. We can kind of work out a plan for how to get to exactly where you want because the thing to think about too is working for IJ and being an academic are both careers 
that take up a lot of your time and they both have different ways of approaching them. So at some point you're probably going to have to choose which one you want to do more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is from Leah, um, and this is more for Sam. For the schools that do accept more than two recommendation letters, can you make your third one also from a professor if the other two are already professors? Yeah, that's certainly fine. I think in general schools do want to see more recommendations coming from professors. They put a really heavy emphasis at the uh, admission level on the sort of analytical skills improvement academic competence. Um, and for better or for worse, I think things like proven academic potential on the LSAT or your GPA are weighed more heavily than proven professional competence, um, for better or for worse. Um, so certainly if you can do more than two letters from a professor and you're, you'll get compelling letters, that's the important thing to remember. Um, if, you can have, if you have three professors who know you well and can write great letters, certainly put three in if, if the school allows it. All right, thank you. Um, the next one's from Allison. Did you take time off between undergraduate and law school, and would you recommend gap years between undergraduate and law school? And what types, of what types of jobs should you look for during that time to make your law application more competitive? Well, I know, Sam, you took time off, right? I did, yes. Uh, I didn't I take a... time off myself, so I'll let Sam uh, feel that. Yeah, I took about two years off. I wouldn't recommend taking too much longer just because it's easy to get out of the sort of academic uh, world. Um, it's easy to, you know, at a certain point you want to actually start your life. So you don't want to be in school until you're, you know, 35 years old. So um, I would recommend about two or three years is probably good. Uh, as to what sort of field you should go into, I don't think it is especially important. But it should be something that will, uh, I think, play to your strengths and play to where you want to go in, in your career. So, I mean, if you're interested in, um, working in public interest law or you think that might be appealing to you, go work for a public interest law firm. If you want to, you know, be an academic, uh, you know, I don't know, a uh, think tank or something like that, you can work. It's not important that you're necessarily doing legal work, but it will be helpful in your future career and it will look good when it comes to things like personal statements in a very, I guess, more cynical way, but to be able to plug that into your broader narrative that you're trying to tell. So I have been working on the Hill um, in D.C., and I was able to work that experience into telling a broader story about why I was interested in studying the law and what my academic interests were, and, uh, and I think that was beneficial to my application. I went straight in after undergraduate, but um, that was just because I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to get out of law school, and I think the majority people who go straight out of undergraduate don't necessarily know what they want to do. I had a lot of classmates who kept saying, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, when we were getting into our third year of law school, which isn't a situation you want to be in. So if you think law school seems like a good idea, but you can't put your finger on exactly why, then I would certainly recommend holding off on it. If I had one concluding thought on that, one benefit that I have seen a lot from people who have, uh, have worked before uh, starting law school is just um, the sort of discipline you get. Um, there's a lot of horror stories about what law school is like. Um, I'm not that far into my uh, first year to really um, speak too authoritatively on it, but everyone I've talked to, at least here, has said that's pretty much a 40-hour a week job. And if you treat it like a job, if you get up at 9 and work until 5, you know, uh, diligently, uh, it'll be very manageable. People that haven't had the experience working, depending on what kind of student you were at the undergraduate level, may benefit simply from the discipline that you get from being in the working world for a little bit. But that's a completely individual sort of an assessment you need to make. Okay, the next question came while you were speaking, Sam, during your presentation. And it just simply says, should you ask your recommenders to also fill out the evaluations? I'm not sure specifically what evaluations are being talked about, though. Yeah, to be entirely honest, I'm not positive what the evaluation is. I just saw that when I went on earlier today to the site, and I don't think I had to do that last year. I'd check with the LSAC on their like, FAQs or something like that. Um, 
to get a feel for what the, the distinction is between those two. But just on my gut instinct, I wouldn't preclude it. Again, what you're trying to do is to provide um, a, a picture of yourself to admissions committees. And it is much better to have somebody provide you know, both an evaluation and a um, letter of recommendation, somebody that knows you well, than to be stuck trying to get somebody who doesn't know you well. It's not going to serve the purposes of the application process, and it won't benefit you, certainly. So I mean, as long as it's something that's permitted by LSAC, I would not you know, preclude that as a, as a possibility if it, if it would advance your application. Okay, the next question is from Adam. Um, Sam, can you provide an example of showing analytical skill in a cover letter? Uh, an example of showing what? Analytical skill in your cover letter. Um, yeah, how to provide an example of it. I think it would be maybe something best shown through perhaps talking about actual experience that you've had. Um, either, you know, typically there is a broad sort of um, categories, I guess, that uh, cover or that personal statements tend to follow. Either you're telling a, a, about a challenge that you faced, about some sort of significant experience, about um, something that shaped you as a person, either um, in childhood or adulthood and things like that. And so it's supposed to be something pretty personal and saying, showing perhaps the way that you address the problem that you face, the way that you um, um, uh, dealt with the challenge that you're trying to discuss or something like that. Um, to show it directly is, is a little difficult, but um, I, I would do my best at least to show that you're a, um, you know, intelligent and thoughtful person. And I think it gets displayed more in just the ability to coherently tie together disparate aspects of, of your personal story into a unified narrative. Okay, what areas of law besides constitutional law or law and economics do you think are most needed from legal academics in the liberty movement? Ooh, I would, I would advise um, people who want to be academics to stay away from constitutional law. Um, specifically. That's a highly coveted area and you're not going to make any friends um, having the type of views you have going on the market. That's something that you kind of need to earn your way into in the future to be completely honest. Um, it is an important area to liberty but it's it's not the one to attempt to break into academia with. Um, I would say um, aside from law and economics, which which we do still have need for um, liberty advancers in because it's starting to move more to the left and we're kind of getting complacent in law and economics traditionally being more um, liberty friendly than the other areas, but also um, contract law I would say um, is a good area because um, you can highlight opportunities for contracts to fill in um, where government government intervention does not need to, and also business organizations, given the amount of regulations going on. Um, that's not a very popular area. People don't really get excited about business organization, um, but it's important to know how regulations affect businesses so that this can be conveyed when an innocent seeming law that maybe just says, well, you know, um, women are work too hard when they have to work over 40, 40 hours a week so they shouldn't, they shouldn't have to. That can be approached from a constitutional law perspective but then that can also be approached from how does it affect businesses and, and that sort of way. So it's kind of a, a sneaky way of um, looking at the other way, the other way regulations affect things other than the obvious constitutional issues out there. Okay, the next question is from Jonathan. It says, I'm currently an MBA student at Hating and how can I know if the problem is the business program itself and not grad school? In other words, how do I draw a contrast between business school and law school to see if moving to law school is a good move? Well, what is it that he doesn't like about uh, 
the MBA program because they're both they're both professional schools. They're very different from getting a PhD or a master's in that they're training you to do a specific job. So the specific type of job is different in a law degree and the classes certainly are different, but it's the same in that you're being regimented towards one specific career. Well, if Jonathan writes back with more details, I'll definitely follow up. Sure. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, the next one is from Alexander. What are the noticeable differences in law school quality? And by, that, by that I mean, how do the top schools set themselves apart in strategy? I would say a lot of the core classes that you take at law schools are, are the same because schools are, are basically teaching you to pass the test. You're, you need to pass the bar exam in order to succeed, so they have to have some sort of core curriculum in order to help you pass them. But what um, Yale and Harvard and other schools offer you that other ones won't is um, close mentorship with top professors. Uh, so for example, um, at Harvard and Yale, a way to get ahead, especially as an academic, is not necessarily through the grades, which you need, uh, but Harvard and Yale students are already top students. Um, what you need is a mentor who can help pull you along, introduce you to the right people, help you figure out what topics you should be writing about. And that's something you can only get at a top university at that high of quality. Um, there's also, schools are set apart in quality as far as their clinics go too. Some don't have strong clinic programs and others do. And clinics, if you're looking to get experience actually practicing law in a courtroom, those will help you do it. Um, so if you look at the curriculums blanketly, they'll all look pretty much the same. But you have to take into consideration what sort of professors are in the school, whether programs do they offer, um, you know, like what are your law review opportunities, what are your moot court opportunities, and things like that that don't seem as important when you initially look at the school, but ultimately end up being the chances that you need to get ahead. And just to, to follow up on the mentoring aspect, there's also the network that you get from professors when it comes to clerkship opportunities, which if you're interested in an academic career are highly advisable. Uh, you know, professors that you get at places like Harvard and Yale have strong connections to you know, circuit court and Supreme Court uh, judges and justices respectively, typically because they've previously taught at those institutions. And as such, when it comes time to try to get one of those clerkships, um, you know, a letter of recommendation or a kind word coming from one of those judges' former colleagues will get you pretty far in re relative to your com competition. I'm glad you brought that up, Sam, because um, even in, in private practice, I was at an event, um, I was at a Federalist Society event actually, and there was a lot of students in attendance and a lot of lawyers as well, and one lawyer walked up to a group and said, are you the Harvard kids? And they said yes, and he goes, does any of you need an internship? Because he needed interns, and instead of putting it out there on the market and having people apply, he just walked up to a group of Harvard students at an event and seeing which ones still need jobs. Okay, the next question is, um, how important are letters of recommendation? What if one doesn't have a close relationship with any professors? They are important. Um, I guess the question is, you know, what do you mean by, by a close relation? Um, if there's a professor that you had a seminar with that you, you know, you maybe talked in the course and did respectively well, that might be a good one to, to get a recommendation from. And actually, the one that I, one of my recommenders was just such a professor. I wasn't the type that I was hanging out in his office hours every day and you know, going to the bar with him after class ended or anything like that. We didn't have an extremely close personal connection. But I had, uh, I had taken a seminar class with him. I was engaged with the ideas. I spoke a lot in class, and uh, I did well in the class. And um, the main thing is that the professor has uh, some knowledge of you as a as a student, um, more than necessarily you as, and your other aspects of life. So um, I would think there should be at least somebody that you're able to find that can provide um, a, a good window into uh, your academic potential you know, for the admissions committees. You'd want to have professors even if you don't have the close relationship. Because if, if I were on the hiring committee, I would wonder what you were hiding or, or why you couldn't get a single person to write on your on your behalf. And one thing I did with one of my letters is I had a 
professor who was known for being a stickler for grades in school and I had gotten a very good grade in this class and when I went up to him and told him I was applying um, to schools and I mentioned the grade that I got in his class even though we never had a close relationship he was impressed that I got that grade in his class and then he went and looked me up and looked at what I had done and took the effort to write a letter for me because of that so that's one avenue too you could always go back to someone that maybe you didn't necessarily know that well um, but sort of start a friendship based on the fact that you were interested in this person's class and you did well in it. Okay, this is the final question. I'm sorry for the uh, other questions we didn't get to. I'm sure if you send an email to either Sam or Jean, they would gladly go into more detail about some of your questions. Um, can highlighting experience in researching and writing research, pa writing research papers in undergrad show effectively a type of analytical, analytical thinking that you were referring to earlier? Yeah, I think they certainly are showing that they show both that you're analytic or that you're intellectually driven, that you're taking the time to think about these sorts of issues and typically going beyond the minimal requirements of your academic program. And they also necessarily will require you to do this sort of critical analysis of, of problems that um, law schools tend to look for a lot. So when I say, you know, analytical skills, you, I think people tend to think of like, you know, math theory or like logic games and things like that. And it's not necessarily that. It's just the ability to address problems, to tinker with problems, and to try to break them down and, and think about them in a rigorous way. And so uh, research in that sense is certainly, and writing in that sense is certainly valuable. It is, I do think, a little different from the kind that you might do in a legal academic world. Um, and just to conclude, um, if you're interested in legal academia, uh, Eugene Volokh of the Volokh Conspiracy Blog has a great uh, book that, that's available online on like academic legal writing. Um, look him up. Uh, it's V-O-L-O-K-H. Uh, and has a great introduction both for students on like getting onto law review, writing comments and things like that, as well as for people trying to enter the uh, world of professors. So uh, if that's the way you want to go, I certainly recommend that book. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dean and Sam, and all of our participants this evening. I hope you guys are going to be able to come back and uh, participate in the future webinars. Our next webinar is next Monday, October 4th. Professor Bradley Hobbs of Florida Gulf Coast University will be lecturing on the pessimistic bias, developing historical perspectives on human progress. Please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org, to register and see the list of upcoming webinars. On a final note, in a few hours, we'll be emailed a follow-up survey of the webinar. Please take a few minutes to fill it out. It helps us know how to improve the programs and make these webinars more interesting to you. And with that, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening.